Welcome everybody. This is Margaret Lawrence from the Moss Art Center and we're going to get started in just a minute. Well, welcome everybody. I know folks will continue to trickle in, but we have a great group here today. Um, welcome to the Moss Art Center's In the Moment series where we get to know the artists who are living right here in our own community. Um, it's great to see all of you. And um, I think you're already muted, but if you didn't get that slide, if you can please mute yourself and put your view on speaker, that's the best way to see our program today. Um, today, I'm very excited um, to have a phenomenal guest, Earl White, and we'll have time to, I'll have time to talk to him. Um, we'll get to hear him play um, music and you will um, have a chance to ask questions as well. That's really an important part of the program today. Um, I'm the director of programming at the Moss Art Center. It's uh, such a thrill to be here. And um, I am coming to you today from the traditional land of the Tudelo and Monacan people. We pay respect to the Tudelo and Monica nations and also acknowledge the university's historical ties to the indentured and enslaved people whose labors built this institution. We pay respect to these people for their contributions to Virginia Tech. I also wanna mention that we're very excited to have just announced all of our fall um, in-person performances at the Moss. Um, season tickets are already on sale and you can see more about that. I'm sure there'll be a link going into the chat any moment. Um, and also I wanted to mention a really special project we're now working on. It will culminate this spring, but right now we are asking the whole community, um, all of the New River Valley um, for nominations of their, our own region's unsung heroes. The project is called Monuments. It's gonna be a really extraordinary nighttime projection onto trees that'll happen later this spring. But right now, we'd love for everybody on this call to check it out and really think about who makes our community better, whose name might not be known, any individual. We'd love to get your nominations, and there will also be a link about that in the chat. Let's get down to it. Today's <laughs> guest is Floyd, and I know we have folks from Floyd. Shout out to Floyd. Um, Floyd-based fiddler, Earl White. He's also known to many as the co-founder of Big Indian Farm, Artisanal Bakery, excuse me. And he is rooted in the practice, the teaching, and the sustaining of American string band traditions. Fiddlin' Earl White has been a prominent figure in the old time music and dance community for more than 48 years. He is one of the few African Americans playing and perpetuating this music. Um, that was once an essential part of Black culture and Black communities across the U.S. He's a founder of the famed Green Grass Cloggers, um, who are celebrating their 50th anniversary, so <laughs> congratulations, and represent Earl's initial start with playing old-time music. He's leader of the Earl White String Band, and Earl is really, as many of you know, as much a convener and connector and teacher as an entertainer. In 2016, Earl White and his family moved from California to their farm in the Indian Valley region of Floyd County. And there they raise Icelandic sheep. They own and operate an organic sourdough bakery, sponsor music camps, and teach. And he teaches old time fiddle. And he's very, very actively participating in online and in-person camps and concerts. And in fact, we're very excited to talk to him amidst um, the fiddle jam on Big Indian Farm, which takes place this weekend. So welcome, <laughs> <Right>. Earl White. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret. And I <laughs> want to ex extend my thanks to you inviting me to, to share my moments of <laughs> music and stories uh, with your audience. So thank you. 
it's great to have you and thanks for taking the time out today from what must be a very, very busy day. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> it has been busy. It started on Wednesday and I'd say probably about 200 people are already here, so. Amazing, and the rest are on this Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Well, I wonder, I mean, I have tons of questions for you. I wonder if we okay. could start by maybe um, telling us about your particular brand of music and what, what is it that really draws you to, to it? Well, it's uh, you know, technically uh, termed uh, traditional. It's one of the forms of traditional American music. Probably I'd say about the oldest music that has been played uh, somewhat in the, in the United States. And it has its roots in, you know, pretty much every genre, every section of the United States, uh, the Appalachians in particular. So a lot of this music, I'd say, a lot of us say this music is as old as the hills. And it has its roots very much in the uh, Irish, Scottish community. Um, and a lot of the music also came very much from the Black community. Now, what you have is, um, in the Appalachian Mountains, uh, you had a lot of people of Scottish and Irish descent, a lot of Germans also. But again, when you think about that stretch from Maine to Georgia uh, in the Appalachian Mountains, we're primarily talking about that Southern Appalachian region. Well, as a result of that, yeah, slaves living on plantations, if they had an opportunity to escape, a lot of them found refuge in the Appalachian Mountains. They were brought in by the Native Americans. Uh, they were brought in by a lot of the uh, 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 people of Irish descent, uh, primarily because they were considered among the lowest of the low as well. So you had a bunch of people in that region that had common ground. And um, that's the music that I I just kind of latched onto and have been hooked onto and, and I love it. I can't believe I've been doing the one thing for 50 years, <laughs> about 50 years. I started playing the fiddle at uh, 19, got my first fiddle at 19, so. Well, I was gonna ask you, you know, can you tell us more specifically just how you got started? Did you started. get the fiddle and then try to figure out how to play it or what oh, were you yes. hearing and where were so I danced, uh, as Margaret mentioned, I'm a, one of the founding members of the famed uh, Greengrass Cloggers. And this year we're having our 50 union, uh, celebrating our 50 years of, of, of clogging. So I was a student at East Carolina University, uh, majoring in psychology, minoring in drama. And I, myself and a bunch of other psychology majors started a crisis intervention center off campus. And one of the guys who was in that group, who happened to be an artist, Dudley Culp, I'd say the late Dudley Culp, now he died maybe a month ago or so, but um, he went to a fiddler's convention and learned how to clog. And he brought it back to Greenville and was sharing it amongst all of his friends. And for a while, he looked like he had a real affliction, <laughs> but, but he just kept doing it. And as he kept doing it, it literally it just sounded like he was playing drums with his feet. And this was something that a lot of us had not experienced as students. And so as he continued doing it, a bunch of us just really jumped on board and got to the point where every week, a bunch of students were gathering and just learning and creating these things we called clogging. So, um, after getting kicked out of our house because people thought that we were going to tear the floor joist out, uh, we got a space in the uh, um, parks and recreation. And one night this lady, her name was Betty Casey, she happened to come by and she turned out to be a professional square dance caller, calling mostly Western squares. So she started coming every week and teaching us square dancing. And from that, her, um, husband was an editor of one of the local newspapers and they did as she got us our first gig and from that gig they did a write-up about the green grass cloggers and the effect that we had on these patients that came out and from that point forward people just started calling us and asking us to dance here dance there and i'm it sorry was, the, the effect the effect that you had on the on the patients the effect that we had it was at a mental uh, hospital 
<laughs> so uh, they brought people in, into the auditorium who were a lot of them were in straight jackets. A lot of them, I, I guess, appear to be so medicated. But uh, according to the staff, a lot of these people did not respond to any kind of visual or you know, audi audio stimulation at all. They were just uh, more like blank slates. And when we started dancing to the music of the Flatland Family Band, a lot of these patients just started bobbing and responding to our dancing. And some of the people that were there uh, took pictures and uh, did a big write up in the newspaper. And it was from that experience, I think, just seeing the way that those people were, were responding, that we pretty much got our start as the Greengrass Cloggers. I mean, because again, we were all students just getting together for the fun of it. We had no name. <laughs> that was totally unthinkable. But um, that's how we basically started as the Greengrass Cloggers. Well, you know, we danced at a lot of bluegrass festivals. In fact, in those days, we danced primarily to bluegrass music. We danced all of the big bluegrass festivals. And, you know, needless to say, never saw pretty much any people of color there. And there were a few, like at the Galax Fiddlers Convention, I talked to some of the old timers and they would tell me, yes, well, back in the day, there were, uh, you know, scores of black families who would come to the Galax Fiddlers Convention. And my question, well, where are they? <laughs> you know, do you know these people? Are they in the community? But anyway, um, we were dancing primarily to bluegrass music and uh, as far as seeing any black representation, I just never really saw it. Well, we were dancing in Evergreen Valley, Maine at a festival that was with Alice Cooper, Susan and Crofts, um, Jefferson Airplane, and Little Feet and the Green Grass Cloggers. <laughs> and uh, there was a black um, musician, uh, they called him Papa John Creech. And he played violin with Little Feet and he also played a little bit with Jefferson Airplane. But uh, he was sitting in the green room and was playing his fiddle. He's playing it as a fiddle and not a violin. And that was basically my first real representation of seeing a black person play the instrument as a fiddle because I mean, I'd seen black violinists all over but uh, seeing someone actually play it as a fiddle that was, and I looked at him and I said, I wanna do that. <laughs> <laughs> and that was in 1975. And the Christmas of 1975, uh, my best friend went home. And when she came back, she brought with her a fiddle that belonged to her brother-in-law, who got it from his uncle's grandfather. So we did a little research on the fiddle. And it was one that had been uh, bought through the Sears and Roebuck catalog. And again, this was a handmade instrument, because back in those days, they were all handmade, and if you wanted one, Seals and Roebuck was a good place to get it. So, a uh, hundred plus years before that, it had been purchased, and and I started playing the fiddle and never looked back. <laughs> you still have that fiddle? I still have that fiddle. Oh, <laughs> is it your only fiddle? No, I <laughs> have become a collector of fiddles, so I have more than I can play at one time. <laughs> so okay, so you were in you were like intoxicated by this experience of seeing Papa John preach how does one then what were you in your 20s maybe how, I was 17 how do you start how do you start? how do you start playing that style of fiddle well as I tell my students a lot of it is listening and then trying to duplicate the sound that you're hearing so what I have done like I've never had a lesson uh but from all of my travels as a dancer and then to go into the festivals, yeah, I was always very, very intrigued by you know, watching the fiddlers. I mean, there are no frets. So how do you know where to put your finger? <laughs> that was my first question. And um, you know, so a lot of it just came out of feel and, um, and just uh, listening. And once you kind of know where to put your fingers, then it's a matter of trying to duplicate what you're hearing. And even in that duplication over a period of time, I mean, because, I mean, I can listen to CDs and 
if they're friends of mine who are playing, I can point out one fiddler over another just based on the 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 texture of their approach to to playing the instrument. So um, yeah, it's some people say it's not easy. I don't know. I give lessons, and I think it's easy. And I think my approach to teaching makes it easy for the people. One of my oldest students was 85 years old. And this guy came to my class and he said, you know, I decided before I die, I got to learn to play the fiddle. And within two weeks, I had him playing his first tune. Amazing. But now this kind of music, I mean, you came to it as a clogger. Is mm -hmm. it the same music that would be used for clogging? And, or how, what's the relationship between this music and dance? Well, it's, uh, it's the music that the slaves played in their uh, quarters, you know, after working in the fields during the day. Well, when they would go home, this is what they played. Um, it's the music that was taught by uh, their masters, because if they taught it to the slaves, as, as slave musicians, um, now the musicians were commodities that they could rent to the next plantation for their parties. Um, and then, again, coming out of that Appalachian region, you had the people of Irish and Scottish descent who settled in those hills. And again, these were people who, a lot who were friendly and uh, took in escaped slaves, gave them refuge. Uh, I can remember uh, you know, when I was a kid, hearing my uh, great, great, great uncles say things like, we're going to the nation. Well, they were going from Eastern North Carolina and going to the Cherokee Nation in Western North Carolina. You know, what was basically left of it. But again, a lot of it being, um, uh, and, and this is what I teach all my classes. You know, the old time music is not a black music. It's not a white music. It was always shared. And old time music is a culmination of all those ethnic groups uh, coming together and making this music and creating this music. And so, and even like the Native Americans, you know, even had a contribution to the music. So when you look at the dance, the Irish had their Irish step, step dancing. The slaves did more of what they called a flat footing, which was closer to the ground, more brushes, more slides, primarily just dancing in the dirt. So you weren't look, looking for that percussive aspect that you get with Irish step dancing. And so you take that together, the Native Americans did, uh, uh, you know, you might hear, have heard the term buck, the bucks. The bucks were the ones going, the young guys were the ones going off to war. So they had a war dance. And, and what came out of that were more high steps and, and high kicks. And that was termed uh, buck dancing. So you take buck dancing, the combination of the flat footing and the Irish step dancing, you put all that together and put it in a hat and shake it up. And then you pour it out and what comes out is clogging. <laughs> <laughs> but so when you listen to this, I guess I'm fascinated because when you're listening to this music, you know, it does make you want to dance. But oh, yeah. as somebody making that music, are you able to like pull apart for us? What is it in that music that does make us want to dance? Yes, I think it's the rhythm. Rhythm, like, for example, I'm going to, going to give you an example here. So if I'm playing a tune, um, so Scotch Irish, you might be familiar with bagpipes, and you know how the bagpipe has a continuous drone, and as that drone is going through, you hear that, and then behind that drone, you have the notes dancing around that drone. Okay, um, well in the hills of West Virginia and western parts of Virginia, that Appalachian chain, when people didn't have uh, the bagpipes, they would tune their instruments to sound like the bagpipes, okay? So here's an example of that drone. So that, ooh, I got my A, ooh on. 
So there's that constant drone. And then the rest of my notes were pretty much dancing around that. So it's almost like, how can you not dance to that? How can you not move? I once played for a funeral and, you know, with a friend of mine who died and, and you know, he loved the music. And so his wife had me play for his funeral and they had me sit in the back of a church. And as I walked in, literally, there was so much moan and groan. You could basically, it was so quiet, you could hear a pin drop. And they sat me in the back of the corner and I just started playing fiddle tunes. And as I'm looking under the bleachers, you see, first you started to see heads bob, then you started to see the feet pat, and then the foot stumping got a little bit louder. And then people, then the volume of conversations, you know, people actually started talking to each other and the volume of conversation went up. And before you know it, there was laughter and there was joy. And this is what my deceased friend wanted. <laughs> what he wanted, uh, not moaning and groaning, but he wanted laughter and he wanted joy around you know, the celebration of his passing. Yeah, so, and music is such a motivator, right? It's just... Uh, and it's a great connector too. I mean, in the old time world, we have, especially uh, as fiddlers, we say, I'm going to take, up my, take out my fiddle and rosin my bow and make myself welcome wherever I go. And, you know, it's a really, really good, good connector and it gets you out of trouble too. <laughs> and what I mean by that- Is there a story about that? There is a story about that. So I, um, you, I, I'm a respiratory therapist, retired respiratory therapist, but I did home care for a while living in Pennsylvania. And there was a lot of distance between my patients' homes. So I, and then I lived in upstate New York and would visit my kids down in uh, Virginia. And on Route 81, I would take out my fiddle and this was like in the beginning of my playing, I would take out my fiddle and cruise down Route 81 playing fiddle tunes and driving with my knees because there weren't a lot of curves. And <laughs> as I'm cruising down 81 once, you know, I, I, I know I was speeding because I was just, I was just all over my fiddle tune and it seemed like the faster I played, the my foot would just hit the pedal. And so I was just, cruising down the road and I happened to look over to my left and there was a patrol car and the guy looked over at me and I looked at him and he just shook his head and he said pull over so I pulled over and put my fiddle down on the seat and I'm, I'm, I was shaking in my boots and I'm like oh no oh god he, he's going to make sure I get put under the jail and so the guy came up he walked up and he says now son please tell me I didn't just see you playing the fiddle. I've been clocking you at 90 miles an hour for miles and miles and miles. Didn't you hear my siren? I was like, uh, no officer. And yes, I was playing the fiddle. And he just shook his head and he says, get, just get out of the car, get, get out of the car. And I'm like, oh God, officer, you know, it, uh, yeah. So anyway, I get out of the car. He starts walking to a toward his patrol car and he said, no, 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 bring your fiddle because I don't even know how to write this up. <laughs> you know? And besides that, who's going to believe it? 90 miles an hour, cruising down the road, playing the fiddle. So he takes me over to his uh, patrol car and says, now I want to see whether or not you can really play that thing. So generally, if a patrolman stops you, they open their intercom to let their buddies know in case they you have to call for help. And so he opens his intercom and he says, says now play me, a, now prove it to me, just play me a tune. So this is the tune I play. It's called Devil in the Straw Stack and I learned it by way of uh, Tommy Jarrell. So it starts like this. Behold, I can hear all the other patrolmen clapping. 
<laughs> through their intercom, through their radios. And he looked at me and says, well, by God, you can play that thing. And then he, then he was like, now, son, I'm going to tell you, I've been driving this post for some 30 odd years and never in my born days have I ever <laughs> stopped one, someone from playing the fiddle while driving. And I said, yeah, officer, I'm, I, I'm just, I'm really, 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 really sorry. I mean, and I will never, ever, ever do anything like that again. And he says, well, no, I just don't even know how to write this up, but you know, but you played that darn tune. You played that tune very well. And he said, so I'm, I'm going to get, I got to give you something. I got to give you a ticket. So how about defective equipment, <laughs> which means broken tail light or some, some defective equipment. And so he writes the ticket up and hands it to me and I'm, oh, thank you, sir. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. So I get back in my car and think about it for a bit. I started off, drove about 50 miles down the road, grabbed my fiddle and finished my tune. <laughs> and that was my story. <laughs> and you've dined out on the story ever since, right? And, and he really gave you a gift. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to make sure we get a chance to um, hear some music. And I know oh, yeah. you have some special guests. So do you want to introduce us to your musical partners today? Yes, here we are. We're going to introduce my lovely wife, uh, Adrian Davis, and a longtime friend of mine and also uh, a former and occasional current Greengrass clogger. <laughs> Um, yes. Mm -hmm. This is Mr. Uh, Gordy Henners, and we're going to play some old timey tunes here. Oh, you're in A now? No, I'm in D, but I can. You're in D. Right no, here. D is good. So, another thing about old time music, and that's one of the things I really like about it, uh, is that um, depending on the key that you're playing in, you can. Um, retune your instrument relative to that. And that's what I was saying earlier about how uh, when a lot of the Scotch and the Irish did not have their uh, their bagpipes, they would a lot of times tune their instruments to mimic some aspect of the bagpipe. And it kind of all goes back to that drone that I was talking about, and then the notes dancing around that. And uh, I got to tell you also, it generally sounds better when it's in tune. <laughs> <laughs> I used to have some friends who, uh, um, God, what was the name of that band? But anyway, they made a bunch of hats and t-shirts that said, old time music, better than it sounds. <laughs> it was a lot. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> okay, all right. So how about a little bit of that old, uh, what well, you got one there? How about that Cumberland Gap? Okay. Now there are many Cumberland Gaps, there are many versions of Cumberland Gaps and in, uh, in almost every town, it seemed like every region of the Appalachian Mountain, there is a Cumberland Gap, even up as far north as uh, I lived in the Catskills and learned uh, in the Catskill Mountains, which is also part of that Appalachian region. And I uh, learned a whole bunch of tunes coming from that region as well. You know, again, the, just from Maine to Georgia, there's this mecca of old time and, and not just old time, but uh, aspects of old time, because northern old time is very different from southern old time. Okay, so this is a tune that uh, comes from somewhat around this area, I think North Carolina way, and it's called uh, Cumberland Gap. <laughs> Thank you. 
Permanent gap. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. People are clapping on the Zoom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, you're um, welcome. I want to I want to encourage people listening to and enjoying this great music to go ahead and put your questions uh, in the chat and so that when they finish we can take your questions. But please yeah. um, give us some more music if you would. Okay. All right. So um, Tommy Jarrell, a uh, fiddler down from around, down in North Carolina. And uh, I know at one point, yeah, a lot of people consider him the grandfather of old time music. Um, he was certainly more like a grandfather when I discovered him and when we discovered him. And so he's very much like our grandfather of old time yeah. music. But here's another um, tune that um, I learned by way of, of Tommy Jarrell. And, you know, I had mentioned this before, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, with the old time music, it's not a black music, it's not a white music, you know, it's a, it was always a music that, that was shared. And the unfortunate part is that a lot of the music that was learned uh, by white musicians from black musicians, you know, there was not a lot of reference or credit given to those people. I mean, you might see a lot of uh, pictures of uh, black people holding banjos or even uh, holding fiddles, old pictures, but generally there's no real name associated with it at all. I remember uh, we were dancing at the Angiers Festival and the Bill Monroe band was backing us up. And uh, Bill Monroe walks over to me and says, you know, it's my Bill Monroe voice. <laughs> <laughs> You know, <laughs> you remind me a lot of a fella that I used to play with way, way, way back when. But again, there was no name, no name associated with it. And so, you know, I was 20 years old, so big deal, <laughs> you know? And yeah, it didn't mean anything, a whole lot to me other than it was a memory for him. Well, I went a, on a uh, mission and my mission was to find black fiddlers of which I found none that were living. Um, I ran across one out of North Carolina, Joe Thompson. And but other than that, there weren't just weren't a whole lot of you know, black people playing the music. And again, be, this is a music that was a very prominent part of the black community. So um, here's a tune that I learned by way of Tommy Jarrell. And I think it's on his Green June Apple album, one of his albums, but it's called um, uh, uh, Raleigh and Spencer, and um, it's got a little singing, so I'm going <clears> to <throat> bring out my voice here. Now for tuning, and as I mentioned a little while ago about the extra tuning on uh, in old time music. Let me use your tuner. Um, that last tune we played was in the key of D, and I had my, so the uh, fiddle is normally tuned uh, G, D, A, E, and I had my G string tuned up to uh, an A, okay, and that basically allowed me to do some aspect to really get that drone, that bagpipe drone in there. Well, this tune is also in the key of D, And it has a lot of D. So now this fiddle is tuned. Margaret, you asked me how many I had. Well, I have one for every. <laughs> so this one is tuned uh, D, D, A, D. A lot of D. And a little bit of A. Okay, so it goes something like this. See if you can hear the difference in what we're doing there. I've got a, a lot of drone there. So Raleigh and Spencer. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you. Now, I know among my friends, there's a little bit of controversy. Well, not really the controversy, but discussion. Because sometimes you hear that tune called Raleigh and Spencer, which are these two bordering towns down in uh, North Carolina. And the tunes, it's about prohibition, you know. I mean, they used to run more moonshine than, than anybody could drink. <laughs> but anyway, and then you, sometimes you hear uh, people refer to it as Riley and Spencer. Well, here's my take on that. Probably learned it from some old guy. <laughs> and if it's a lot of the old, a lot of the old guys I talked to when I was first starting to learn to fiddle, a lot of them didn't have any teeth. And so it probably came out like this. Riley and Spencer. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like Raleigh Spencer, Riley Spencer. Yeah. If you just say those two words, most of us know what you're going for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have people starting to ask questions but if there's one more quickie that you'd like to share we would be we'd love it it's up yeah. to you yeah of course I'll go back to my Okay, all right. Is that chucking the brush? Sure. All right. So this is the tune that I learned uh, many years ago. I learned it from a friend, uh, New York fiddler, Rena Rubin. Although I remember, she can't quite remember learning, <laughs> me learning it from her, but I have a little snippet on a tape where we were sitting down at Mount Airy Fiddler's Convention and having a jam. And she and my friend, Steve Urich, started to play that tune and yeah, after we'd been already sitting there for about six, seven hours, uh, when they started playing that tune, the, the jam busted up. <laughs> so uh, it's one of those tunes that could be a real jam buster. <laughs> and, um, but I got a little snippet, got it on the tape one time through, and then, uh, then what followed that for several minutes was people complaining. <laughs> it's too hard. All right. Shucking the brush. Thank you. 
<laughs> All right. Thank, Checking the thank brush. you. Welcome. How thank wonderful. You. And thanks so much to Mark and Adrian. Everybody sounds phenomenal. Um, what a joy to hear this music play. It makes me want to get up and dance. Oh, yeah. See, I told you so. <laughs> How can anybody just sit still? And just a minor correction that this is Gordy. <laughs> I'm sorry, Gordy. That's fine. <laughs> I'm Gordy had, worse. Yeah, he's, he's being called worse. <laughs> Just don't call him late for dinner. <laughs> well, there's lots of questions um, for you, Earl. Yeah. And um, of course, the time's ticking away. So just quickly, um, somebody has already asked, like, is this um, session, because since we're recording, is it going to be available later? And the answer is yes. It can usually take us some time, but we do intend to post it on the website, the Moss Art Center, under experiences. Mm -hmm. And um, you can see some past ones there already, um, but um, we will certainly alert you um, when that goes up because it's really fun to share that. Um, lots of questions, so much appreciation, people loving it, um, feeling like they started to take music, they need to get back to it now. They um, do, <laughs> we all teach. Questions what? I say they do need to get back to it, and we all they really do. They really do. Um, people want to know, um, you know, where can uh, I think Cynthia wanted to know where can amazing Appalachian musicians um, connect and share and learn from each other? I'm just going to tell you a few, and then you can kind of answer them in the way you want. Um, questions about, you know, where can we get recordings of this great music? Um, and then uh, a question about, you know, like it, obviously you've done so much, Earl, to like look and try to find and gather um, information, history, um, the tunes themselves. Um, have you um, ever kind of cataloged or written down the names and the history of um, the Black musicians uh, and tunes that you've discovered in your research? And then finally, when's the next live performance? So <laughs> whatever order you want. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to throw it all out there. So uh, we own a farm. My wife and I, Adrian, own a farm here in uh, the Indian Valley region of Floyd County. And we moved here. We bought the place about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we actually moved here. It'd be five years in October. But we operate a, an organic uh, sourdough bakery on the farm. And you can look us up. It's called BigIndianFarm.com. We have an online store. And we also do the uh, Floyd and the Blacksburg Farmers Market every Saturday. So if you're in the Blacksburg area, come on over to the market and see me. That's how I met Margaret. <laughs> she was like, are oh, you Earl White? I'm like, uh, <laughs> depends. <laughs> <laughs> but um, come on out and see us. Uh, as far as the music concern is concerned, I'd say in uh, Floyd, Virginia itself, there is the... Um, Floyd Country Store. The Floyd Country Store has a good source of old time music uh, right across the street from them. And they just recently bought the county sales. county sales. And they probably have about the largest concentration of uh, string band music in this region. Um, you can also go online and uh, you know search for people like uh, uh, Gordy Henners and the <laughs> New Southern Ramblers. New Southern Ramblers. Uh, you can look up, recording we're on the Earl White String Band. You can find us all you know, spilled all over the internet. Um, you can find people like Mark Schatz, you know, and his <laughs> bands playing on there. And, um, and then you can also contact me or contact us by way of the fiddling, uh, by way of email, uh, fiddlersjam at gmail. But beyond that, uh, myself and a few of the names that I just mentioned, uh, we just recently started the Big Indian uh, Music Camp, music and events. And right here on our farm, our beautiful 72 acre farm, that's part of our goal is uh, doing instructional camps here, having people come out, people who wanna learn the music, uh, learning from these fabulous musicians those of us who have been doing it for nearly 50 years, <laughs> unbelievable. I can't believe I've been doing this one thing for that long. But, um, and then also um, August 7th, the Earl White String Band is playing at the Dogtown uh, Music Hall in Floyd, Virginia. And uh, you have any other gigs coming up there, Adrian? <laughs> you take care of that. I take care of that, all right, great. 
but that's the next uh, live performance that I know of. And, uh, but yes, if you get on our mailing list uh, as, as we, things evolve here at the farm, like I said, our part uh, goal is to do events. And we just had our first music camp in June. And, you know, our goal, that was the very first one, instructional music camp. And we we're talking another one in potentially in August and then another one in October. So yes, give us a shout. If you're interested in learning this music, we have fabulous teachers and, um, and we'll make sure you learn something. <laughs> Great, and what, what about the question about, um, have you ever tried to start writing down um, what you oh, yes. have discovered um, about black musicians in this music? So, you know, again, there's not a lot of information out there. A lot of people are starting to kind of wake up to the idea of, of finding. In my search for black fiddlers, like I said, I found few, um, but I, what I did gather, um, I um, do an hour long presentation that I do. And I generally, if I'm hired to teach at a camp, that's one of the things that I do, that I do my presentation. And it's titled uh, Black Americans in Old Time Music Then and Now. And I'd just be do a, a chronalized audio visual of where the banjo originated, which was originally an African instrument, and how it basically changed as it came to the United States, and then how it was basically used in the music. And uh, so I have people who are playing the original African instruments who are also then playing the banjo as we know it today. And I talk about people like the, the, the person that um, uh, Bill Monroe said that I reminded him of. Well, in my search, I found out this guy's name was Arnold Schultz. And again, in that search I found, and again, like I said, these are all people who uh, like uh, Chet Atkins learned um, uh, um, a fiddle tune, Martha Campbell from, um, Jesse Owens and, you know, but things like that were here, I had been playing Martha Campbell for years and the only reference I knew was, you know, Chet Atkins or, you know, some of the guys who, when they learned them from these black guys, people that they were playing with, it wasn't cool for them to go out into their community and say, oh yes, I learned this from Arnold Schultz. So, uh, goal being, trying to keep the music alive. Uh, I think coming up here, we might even have some opportunity to do it in schools. Uh, again, from a heritage standpoint, you know, it's at one point it was a very intricate part of the black community. But you know, today you don't find, and, and, and mostly because they just don't know about it. So my goal, our goal, those of us who are collectively uh, perpetuating the old time music scene is to infect as many people as we can. <laughs> Uh, maybe that wasn't politically correct, <laughs> considering what we just went through. <laughs> so I, I'll, I'll refrain from using that reference. <laughs> to share the medicine as, yes, as best we can. <laughs> right. What she said. <laughs> and there's great comments, people also chiming in about, of course, the, um, the big fiddlers conventions like in Galax and um, Elk Creek and you know other places that those are some tremendous and somebody wrote that they um, had been looking about at a book about African banjo echoes in Appalachia and oh, yeah, huh? really specifically and maybe the answer is no but they were wondering like is there a book that pertains more to the fiddle history with black musicians it sounds like maybe that's not so much written down and that's the thing about a lot of the old time music it's not written down it's more of an oral history where it's, uh, it's passed down from generations of families. And, you know, but again, like a lot of the tunes that I've learned, I've listened to them and, you know, I was listening to something with Melvin Wine the other day, a West Virginia fiddler, and he made reference to the fact that here's this tune he was playing. I was like, oh my God, that's a great tune. And then at the end, he talks a little bit about it and said, yeah, well, you know, there was this colored fellow in our community who, we played that tune all the time and, and I, I, I liked it and, and I learned it. <laughs> but um, yes, in terms of, of the fiddle um, connection, there's not a lot written down. Um, uh, 
as far as the dance connection, our good friend Phil Jameson, which is also a green grass clogger, and um, he wrote a book. Um, I don't remember the name. Uh, of Frolics, Reels, Reels and Hoedowns. Yeah. Yes, yeah, Frolics, Reels and Hoedowns. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great book, Thanks. and it basically talks about the history of of dance and history of clogging and how it pretty much relates to the music also. Well, this has just been so much fun and I've, I've learned so much. I think everybody has, and there's obviously some people with a ton of knowledge in their group watching because the chat oh, yeah. is like on fire. And <laughs> um, just want to thank all of you and Earl, thank you so much for your time and for um, just, it's just been so enjoyable. Um, before we leave everyone today, um, in case you joined later, maybe we can throw back into the chat the link um, for the uh, Moss Art Center season. The fall season is now on sale. It's very exciting. Lots of great music and dance and theater and everything. Um, and our third and final of the summer uh, in the moment free Zoom will be um, with a really live wire, another live wire person. <laughs> um, who is based in Blacksburg and is a performer and theater teacher for all ages. And that is the fabulous Joelle Schenk. And she'll be with us on Friday, August 20th at noon. So you can register. I think we'll put a, a link in the chat to register for that. It'll be free um, August 20th. Uh, please join us. Oh. Stay cool today. Enjoy live music and live dance and live everything. And um, thanks again to all our wonderful artists. Have a great day. <laughs> All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks everybody Bye. for joining. <laughs>